The Millennium by Lorraine Bettner Part 1. Postmillennialism Chapter 1. Introduction Page 3 Broadly speaking, there are three general systems which profess to set forth the teaching of Scripture regarding the second coming of Christ and the future course of the kingdom. They are postmillennialism, amillennialism, and premillennialism. The essential presuppositions of the three systems are similar. Each holds that the scriptures are the word of God and authoritative. Each holds to the same general concept of the death of Christ as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and as the only ground for the salvation of souls. Each holds that there will be a future, visible, personal coming of Christ. Each holds that every individual is to receive a resurrection body, that all are to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that the righteous are to be rewarded in heaven, and that the wicked are to be punished in hell. Each of the systems is, therefore, consistently evangelical, and each has been held by many able and sincere men. The differences arise not because of any conscious or intended disloyalty to Scripture, but primarily because of the distinctive method employed by each system in its interpretation of Scripture and they relate primarily to the time and purpose of Christ's coming and to the kind of kingdom that is to be set up at his coming. It should be helpful at the beginning of this study to define each of the systems as clearly as possible. Exact definitions cannot be given since numerous variations are found within each system. However, we submit the following as essentially correct. The first is our own. The latter three, including that of dispensationalism, which is a radical form of premillennialism, are given by Dr. J. G. Voss, a recent writer and son of Dr. Gerhardus Voss, who for many years was a professor in Princeton Theological Seminary. These definitions are presented as the most accurate and comprehensive that we have found. Postmillennialism Postmillennialism is that view of the last things which holds that the kingdom of God is now being extended in the world through the preaching of the gospel and the saving work of the Holy Spirit, that the world eventually will be Christianized and that the return of Christ will occur at the close of a long period of righteousness and peace, commonly called the millennium. This view is, of course, to be distinguished from that optimistic but false view of human betterment and progress held by modernists and liberals, which teaches that the kingdom of God on earth will be achieved through a natural process by which mankind will be improved and social institutions will be reformed and brought to a higher level of culture and efficiency. This latter view presents a spurious or pseudo-postmillennialism and regards the kingdom of God as the product of natural laws in an evolutionary process, whereas orthodox postmillennialism regards the kingdom of God as the product of the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in connection with the preaching of the gospel. Amillennialism Amillennialism is that view of the last things which holds that the Bible does not predict a millennium or period of worldwide peace and righteousness on this earth before the end of the world. Amillennialism teaches that there will be a parallel and contemporaneous development of good and evil, God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom, in this world, which will continue until the second coming of Christ. At the second coming of Christ, the resurrection and judgment will take place, followed by the eternal order of things, the absolute, perfect kingdom of God, in which there will be no sin, suffering, or death. Premillennialism Premillennialism is that view of the last things which holds that the second coming of Christ will be followed by a period of worldwide peace and righteousness before the end of the world, called the millennium or the kingdom of God, during which Christ will reign as king in person on this earth. Premillennialists are divided into various groups by their different views of the order of events associated with the second coming of Christ but they all agree in holding that there will be a millennium on earth after the second coming of Christ, but before the end of the world. Dispensationalism The false system of Bible interpretation represented by the writings of J.N. Darby and the Schofield Reference Bible, 
which divides the history of mankind into seven distinct periods or dispensations, and affirms that in each period God deals with the human race on the basis of some one specific principle. Dispensationalism denies the spiritual identity of Israel and the Church and tends to set grace and law against each other as mutually exclusive principles. The word millennium is derived from two Latin words, milli, meaning thousand, and annum, meaning year. Hence the literal meaning is a thousand years. The term is found just six times in Scripture, all in the first seven verses of the twentieth chapter of Revelation, an admittedly difficult and highly symbolical portion of Scripture. The prefixes post, a, and pre, as used with the word, designate the particular view held regarding the thousand years. Premillennialists take the word literally, holding that Christ will set up a kingdom on earth which will continue for precisely that length of time. Postmillennialists and amillennialists take the word figuratively, as meaning an indefinitely long period held by some to be a part and by others to be the whole of the Christian era. Similarly, the word Chileism, more commonly used in early church history than at the present time, comes from the Greek word Chileus, also meaning thousand. The early Christians who believed that Christ at his coming would set up a one thousand year kingdom were called Chileus. In their historical setting, the words Chileism and Premillennialism have been used as synonyms, and it is commonly understood that today, those who bear the name Premillennialists are logically the same as those who formerly were known as Chileists, although their systems differ in several important respects. It should be said further in regard to dispensationalism that while historic Premillennialism has held that the Church will go through the Tribulation, Dispensationalism holds that the Church will be raptured and so taken out of the world before that event, and that following the rapture there will be a seven-year period, during the first half of which the Jews are in covenant relationship with the Antichrist and dwell in Palestine, but during the last half they endure terrible persecution under the Antichrist. At the end of the second year period Christ returns, annihilates the Antichrist, and establishes his kingdom in Jerusalem. The Jews are to have a position of special favor in the kingdom, and are to remain a body distinct from the Gentiles throughout eternity. Dispensationalists are thus double pre's, pre-tribulation, pre-millennialists. This distinction is of great importance to the dispensationalists, for it gives them a seven-year period, allegedly the seventieth week of Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, during which time all the events foretold in Revelation chapters 4 through 19 are to be fulfilled. That the dispensationalists do attach great importance to this distinction is shown by the vigor with which they attack their fellow premillennialists who are post-tribulationists, that is, who hold that the church does go through the tribulation. Another prominent feature of dispensationalism is its doctrine that when the Jews rejected Christ's alleged offer of the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom was withdrawn and the church was then set up as a substitute, this present church age being therefore an interlude or parenthesis period during which time God deals with man through the church until the return of Christ, when in turn the church is to be taken away and the kingdom established. Dispensationalism is a comparatively recent development. These distinct views were first effectively set forth by John N. Darby, a leader in the Plymouth Brethren group in England about 1830, and later popularized by the Schofield Reference Bible. The real origin of the system, however, was considerably earlier, as we shall show when we discuss the history of the movement. Primarily through the influence of the Schofield Reference Bible, with its explanatory notes printed on the same page with the text, these views have now become the prevailing tenets of premillennialism in the United States. They have never found creedal statement in any of the larger Protestant denominations, but are held by individuals throughout the denominations, and they are the standard belief of various Pentecostal and holiness groups, which as a rule are not noted for scholarship or scientific research. 
They have been further popularized by the Bible Institute, most of which are dispensational in their teaching. These views have been just as consistently rejected and opposed in most of the theological seminaries where scholarship and research are given more prominent and by a large majority of the outstanding theologians. There can be no doubt but that premillennialism lends itself more to an emotional type of preaching and teaching than does postmillennialism or amillennialism. It gives something definite to look for in the immediate future and charges the present with portentous possibilities. While many who hold it do not so exploit it, it often has been used in that manner by those who are less restrained. Premillennialism tends to make the Bible a textbook of ready reference rather than a source book from which statements are to be collected, compared, placed in their logical relations, and so worked up into a systematic theology. It professes to take God at his word and to accept the plain statement of truth as God has revealed it. Such reasoning has its place when directed against the modernists who reject the doctrine of full inspiration of the scriptures. But it is out of place when directed against those who, while accepting the doctrine of the full inspiration of scripture, nevertheless acknowledge that much truth is conveyed through figurative expressions. The fact of the matter is that God's revelation, as found in the Bible, contains many deep mysteries and secrets, which always have, and probably always will, challenge the intellects of even the wisest of men. Superficial statements about taking God at his word, and about the plain harmony of God's word, are illusionary, and ought to be their own refutation. Rejecting such easy solutions, we are deeply grateful for the rich heritage that the scholars and theologians of the church have handed down to us. The deeper understanding of the scriptures and the correlation of these doctrines is not something that can be completed in a day or even a lifetime, but is a task for the church throughout the centuries. Dr. William H. Rutgers, writing on this subject, has well said, If men are engaged in intellectual battle for centuries to settle the Christological problem and so many other theological questions, it is not to be expected that eschatology, the most difficult problem of theological science, will be solved differently. The positiveness and assurance with which many of these Bible students speak concerning the future of God's program is but pride and arrogance. A quote from Premillennialism in America, page 42. Premillennialism thrives best and makes its greatest gains in time of war or of national crisis when people are anxious and worried about the future. Premillennial clergymen from all denominations gather in prophetic conferences to discuss impending events such as the establishment of the nation of Israel and Palestine, the future movements of Russia or Germany, signs that the apostasy has about run its course, etc., as as these are assumed to be foretold in the hidden wisdom of Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, or the book of Revelation. The earlier forms of premillennialism, as well as the present dispensational doctrines, have been held usually, if not always, by a minority of Christian people. The distinctive dispensational doctrines occupy a much less prominent place in European than in American church life. There are then three principal views concerning the return of Christ, the postmillennial, which holds that he will return after the millennium, the premillennial, which holds that his return precedes the millennium, and the amillennial, which holds that there is to be no millennium at all in the generally accepted sense of the term. Dispensationalism, sometimes looked upon as a fourth view, is in reality only a more extreme form of premillennialism. Little pretense can be made to originality in this book. Most of what is here said has been said before by scholars much superior to the present writer. The primary purpose of the present work is to make available, in summarized and systematized form, the information concerning these eschatological problems that has been wrought out through generations of careful study by the best scholars that the Church has produced to separate truth from error, and to express that truth as clearly and convincingly as possible. The scripture quotations are from the American Standard Version of 1901, 
rather than the King James Version, since the former is a more accurate translation. Chapter 2, page 10 Representative Theologians in the Different Systems We have said that each of the millennial views has been held by men of unquestioned sincerity and ability. Among postmillennialists should be mentioned, first of all, the great Augustine, whose eminently sound interpretation of Scripture set the standard for the Church for nearly a thousand years. In later times there were the Reverend David Brown, a Scotch Presbyterian minister, and a considerable number of systematic theologians, the Hodges at Princeton, Dr. Charles, Archibald A., and Caspar Worcester Hodge, Jr., the latter having been the writer's revered teacher. Dr. W.G. T. Shedd, Dr. Robert L. Dabney, Dr. Henry B. Smith, Dr. Augustus H. Strong, and Dr. Benjamin B. Warfield. Probably the most influential books from the postmillennial viewpoint have been The Second Advent by David Brown, 1846, but revised in 1849, which for many years was recognized as the standard work on the subject and Dr. Charles Hodges, Systematic Theology, 1871. In more recent times, Dr. Warfield, who died in 1921, has been recognized as the outstanding postmillennial theologian. His influence was exerted through a period of more than 33 years as professor of systematic theology in Princeton Theological Seminary and as editor of the Presbyterian and Reformed Review and later as one of the chief contributors to the Princeton Theological Review. A book by Dr. James H. Snowden, The Coming of the Lord, in 1919, has proved to be of special value. This latter book contains a strong refutation of premillennialism, although Dr. Snowden did not distinguish clearly between premillennialism and dispensationalism. The postmillennial position has been much neglected during the past third of a century, most of the discussion having centered around premillennialism and amillennialism. This has led some to conclude that postmillennialism is no longer worthy of serious consideration. Alexander Rees, for instance, a premillennialist, in his book The Approaching Advent of Christ in 1937, expressed his opinion in these words. Here one can but make the arbitrary statement that the postmillennial interpretation of Oregon, Jerome, Augustine, and the majority of the church theologians ever since is now as dead as Queen Anne and just as honorably buried. Page 306. Dr. Lewis Perry Schaefer, in an introduction to Dr. Charles Feinberg's book entitled Premillennialism or Amillennialism in 1936, says postmillennialism is dead, a statement which he later qualifies by saying that it is dead in the sense that it offers no living voice in its own defense while the millennial question is under discussion. That, however, is not true today, and it was at least debatable at the time it was made. That such was also Dr. Feinberg's opinion was indicated by the title of his book and by his almost complete ignoring of postmillennialism. But such statements are, to say the least, premature. Since postmillennialism has been so ably supported by outstanding theologians and ministers, whose influences continue at the present time, and since it occupies such a prominent place in a number of standard theological works, it seems rather curious to find premillennialists attempting to assign it merely an antiquarian interest. One cannot help but feel that in these cases the wish is father to the thought. Dr. Warfield, who in the opinion of the present writer is to be ranked with Augustine, Calvin, and Charles Hodge as one of the four outstanding theologians in the entire history of the Church, was a postmillennialist, and his collected writings, reprinted in ten large volumes, continue to exert a strong influence in theological circles. Postmillennialism, like Christianity itself has often suffered reverses, but after each such period of neglect or misunderstanding, it has been reasserted with even more power and conviction. Such, no doubt, will be the case after the present period of neglect has run its course. We must remember that premillennialism, too, was almost in total eclipse for a thousand years, 
between the time of Augustine and the Reformation, and that during the Reformation period, and for a long time afterward, it was held by only a few small sects that were considered quite heretical. Furthermore, amillennialism as a system was not clearly developed nor aggressively set forth until very recent times. Two recent books, Israel and the New Covenant, 1954, by Mr. Roderick Campbell, and Revelation 20, 1955, by the Reverend J. Marcellus Kick, Associate Editor of Christianity Today, were written from the postmillennial viewpoint. Also, Mr. Kick's earlier book, Matthew 24, in 1948. In any event, we believe that the true eschatological system can be set forth only on the basis of postmillennialism, and that a careful study of Scripture will establish that fact. Among amillennialists, we find a considerable number of able men, nearly all in recent years. Dr. Louis Burkhoff, Systematic Theology, The Revised Version in 1941. Dr. Gerhardus Voss, he wrote The Pauline Eschatology, 1930. Dr. Albertus Peters, Studies in the Revelation of St. John, 1937. And The Seed of Abraham, 1950. Professor Floyd E. Hamilton, The Basis of Millennial Faith, 1942. Dr. George L. Murray, Millennial Studies, 1948. Dr. William H. Rutgers, Premillennialism in America, 1930. Dr. Abraham Kuyper, Chileism or the Doctrine of Premillennialism, a pamphlet. Dr. Martin J. Wingarden, The Future of the Kingdom, 1934. Dr. William Hendrickson, More Than Conquerors, 1939. Dr. William Mazelink, Why Thousand Years? And Rev. William J. Greyer, The Momentous Event, 1945. Among these, the present writer has found the books by Peters, Hamilton, Murray, and Rutgers particularly helpful. Outstanding writers from the viewpoint of historic premillennialism include Rev. Alexander Rees, The Approaching Advent of Christ, 1937, Dean Alford, The Greek Testament, 1874, Dr. Nathaniel West, the Thousand Years in Both Testaments, 1880. Dr. E. B. Eliot, Horai Epictoli, Four Volumes, 5th Edition, 1862. Dr. H. Grattan Guinness, The Approaching End of the Age, 1880. Dr. S. H. Kellogg, The Jews or Prediction and Fulfillment, 1883. Dr. Henry W. Frost, The Second Coming of Christ, 1934 and Dr. George E. Ladd, Crucial Questions About the Kingdom of God, 1952, and The Blessed Hope, 1956. Outstanding dispensational writers include John N. Darby, Synopsis of the Books of the Bible, Five Volumes, and Other Writings, Dr. C. I. Schofield, The Schofield Reference Bible, 1909, Revised in 1917, Dr. William E. Blackstone, Jesus is Coming, 1878, revised in 1908. Dr. Jesse F. Silver, The Lord's Return, 1914. The Reverend James M. Brooks, Maranatha, 1870. Dr. James M. Gray, Prophecy in the Lord's Return, 1917. Dr. Arno C. Gabeline, The Return of the Lord, 1925. Dr. Lewis Berry Schaefer, Systematic Theology, 1948. Dr. Charles L. Feinberg, Premillennialism or Amillennialism, 1936, enlarged in 1954. Dr. John F. Wolverd, The Rapture Question, 1957. And Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, Things to Come, 1958. There are also other writers who have dealt with special aspects of the Second Coming, as, for instance, Dr. Oswald T. Ellis, whose valuable book, Prophecy and the Church, deals particularly with the dispensational view. Dr. Ellis is an anti-Chiliast, but is not to be classified as either a post- or amillennialist. Chapter 3, page 14, Statement of the Doctrine 
We have defined postmillennialism as that view of the last things which holds that the kingdom of God is now being extended in the world through the preaching of the gospel and the saving work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of individuals, that the world eventually is to be Christianized and that the return of Christ is to occur at the close of a long period of righteousness and peace commonly called the millennium. It should be added that on postmillennial principles the second coming of Christ will be followed immediately by the general resurrection, the general judgment, and the introduction of heaven and hell in their fullness. The millennium to which the postmillennialist looks forward is thus a golden age of spiritual prosperity during this present dispensation, that is, during the church age, and is to be brought about through forces now active in the world. It is an indefinitely long period of time, perhaps much longer than a literal 1,000 years. The changed character of individuals will be reflected in an uplifted social, economic, political, and cultural life of man. The world at large will then enjoy a state of righteousness such as at the present time has been seen only in relatively small and isolated groups, as for example in some family circles, some local church groups, and kindred organizations. This does not mean that there ever will be a time on this earth when every person will be a Christian, or that all sin will be abolished. But it does mean that evil in all its many forms eventually will be reduced to negligible proportions, that Christian principles will be the rule, not the exception, and that Christ will return to a truly Christianized world. Postmillennialism further holds that the universal proclamation of the gospel and the ultimate conversion of the large majority of men in all nations during the present dispensation was the express command and meaning and promise of the Great Commission given by Christ himself when he said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20 we believe that the Great Commission includes not merely the formal and external announcement of the gospel preached as a witness to the nations, as the premillennialists and amillennialists hold, but the true and effectual evangelization of all the nations, so that the hearts and lives of the people are transformed by it. That seems quite clear from the fact that all authority in heaven and on earth and an endless sweep of conquest has been given to Christ, and through him to his disciples, specifically for that purpose. The disciples were commanded not merely to preach, but to make disciples of all the nations. It was no doubtful experiment to which they were called, but to assure triumph. The preaching of the gospel under the direction of the Holy Spirit, and during this dispensation, is therefore the all-sufficient means for the accomplishment of that purpose. We must acknowledge that the Church during the past 19 centuries has been extremely negligent in her duty and that the crying need of our time is for her to take seriously the task assigned to her. Instead of discussions of social and economic and political problems, book reviews, and entertaining platitudes from the pulpit, the need is for sermons with real gospel content designed to change lives and to save souls. The charge of negligence applies, of course, not only to ministers, but equally to the laity. Every individual Christian is called to give his witness and to show his faith by personal testimony, or through the distribution of the printed word, or through the generous and effective use of his time and money for Christian purposes. Christ commanded the evangelization of the world. That is our task. Surely he will not, and in fact cannot, come back and say to his church, well done, good and faithful servant, until that task has been accomplished. The Reverend J. Marcellus Kick has said that there is still a remnant of paganism and papalism in the world is chiefly the fault of the church. The word of God is just as powerful in our generation as it was during the early history of the church. 
The power of the gospel is just as strong in this century as in the days of the Reformation. These enemies could be completely vanquished if the Christians of this day and age were as vigorous, as bold, as earnest, as prayerful, and as faithful as Christians were in the first several centuries and in the time of the Reformation. A quote from Revelation 20, page 74. In contrast with this, premillennialism holds that the world is not to be converted during this dispensation, that it is, in fact, vain to hope for its conversion before the return of Christ. It holds rather that the world is growing progressively worse, that the present age is to end in a great apostasy and rebellion, climaxed by the reign of the Antichrist and the battle of Armageddon, at which time Christ comes with sudden and overwhelming power to rescue his people, destroy his enemies, and establish a 1,000-year earthly kingdom with Jerusalem as its capital. Many seem convinced that we are now in the last stage of the Laodicean apostasy and that the end is very near. Premillennialism thus despairs of the power of the gospel to Christianize the world and asserts rather that it is to be preached only as a witness. Whereas postmillennialism holds that Christ's coming closes this age and that it is to be followed by the eternal state, premillennialism holds that his coming is to be followed by another dispensation, the millennium or kingdom age, and that the final resurrection and judgment do not take place until 1,000 years later. It has also been a standard doctrine of premillennialism in every age that the coming of Christ is near or imminent, although every generation of premillennialists from the first century until the present time has been mistaken on that point. Premillennialism, in its dispensational form, divides the second coming of Christ into two parts. One, the rapture, or his coming for his saints, at which time the righteous dead of all ages are to be raised in the first resurrection, the righteous living translated, and both groups caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And number two, the revelation, which occurs seven years later at the close of the Great Tribulation, at which time Christ returns to earth with his saints, overpowers the Antichrist, defeats and suppresses all his enemies, raises the righteous dead who have died or who have been killed during the Great Tribulation, and establishes his kingdom on the earth. At the close of the millennium, the wicked dead are to be raised in a final resurrection, and this in turn is followed by their judgment and the introduction of the eternal state. The millennium in which the premillennialist believes is thus a direct and personal rule of Christ over this world. Amillennialism, too, differs from postmillennialism in that it holds that the world is not to be Christianized before the end comes, that the world will in fact continue much as it is now, with a parallel and continuous development of both good and evil, of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. It agrees with postmillennialism, however, in asserting that Christ does not establish an earthly, political kingdom, and that his return will be followed by a general resurrection and general judgment. Post and amillennialists thus agree that the kingdom of Christ in this world is not political and economic, but spiritual and now present in the hearts of his people and outwardly manifested in the church. Amillennialism, as the term implies, does not set forth a millennium at all. Some amillennialists apply the term to the entire Christian era between the first and second advent of Christ. Some apply it to a relatively Christian and peaceful era such as the church enjoyed after the bitter persecution of the first three centuries, at which time Emperor Constantine made Christianity the preferred religion of the Roman Empire. Others apply it to the intermediate state. The position of the amillennialist does not necessarily preclude him from believing that the world may be Christianized before the end comes, but most amillennialists have not so held. Rather, they have preferred to say that there probably will not be much relative change. In support of this, they cite the parable of the wheat and the tares, in which both grow together until the harvest. Historically, the main thrust of amillennialism has been much stronger against premillennialism than against postmillennialism, 
since it interprets Revelation 20 symbolically and does not believe that Christ will reign personally in an earthly kingdom. It should be remembered, however, that while post, ah, and premillennialists differ in regard to the manner and time of Christ's return, that is, in regard to the events that are to precede or follow his return, they agree in regard to the fact that he will return personally and visibly and in great glory. Each alike looks for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 Each acknowledges Paul's statement that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 Christ's return is taught so clearly and so repeatedly in Scripture that there can be no question in this regard for those who accept the Bible as the word of God. They also agree that at his coming he will raise the dead, execute judgment, and eventually institute the eternal state. No one of these views has an inherent liberalizing tendency. Hence the matters on which they agree are much more important than those on which they differ. This fact should enable them to cooperate as evangelicals and to present a united front against modernists and liberals who more or less consistently deny the supernatural throughout the whole range of Bible truth. Chapter 4, page 19 Inadequate Terminology One difficulty that we constantly face in this discussion is that of inadequate terminology. The use of the prefixes pre and post as attached to the word millennial, is to some extent unfortunate and misleading. For the distinction involves a great deal more than merely before or after. The millennium expected by the premillennialist is quite different from that expected by the postmillennialist, not only in regard to the time and manner in which it will be set up, but primarily in regard to the nature of the kingdom and the manner in which Christ exercises his control. The postmillennialist looks for a golden age that will not be essentially different from our own so far as the basic facts of life are concerned. This age gradually merges into the millennial age as an increasingly larger proportion of the world's inhabitants are converted to Christianity. Marriage and the home will continue and new members will enter the human race through the natural process of birth as at present. Sin will not be eliminated but will be reduced to a minimum as the moral and spiritual environment of the earth becomes predominantly Christian. Social, economic, and educational problems will remain, but with their unpleasant features greatly eliminated, their desirable features heightened. Christian principles of belief and conduct will be the accepted standards. Life during the millennium will compare with life in the world today in much the same way that life in a Christian community compares with that in a pagan or irreligious community. The church much more zealous in her testimony to the truth and much more influential in the lives of the people will continue to be then, as now, the outward and visible manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth. In the millennium will close with the second coming of Christ, the resurrection and final judgment. In short, postmillennialists set forth a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. On the other hand, the millennium expected by the premillennialist involves the personal, visible reign of Christ as king in Jerusalem. The kingdom is to be established not by the conversion of individual souls over a long period of time, but suddenly and by overwhelming power. The Jews are to be converted not as individuals and along with other groups of the population, but suddenly and unmasked at the mere sight of Christ and are to become the chief rulers in the new kingdom. Nature is to share in the millennial blessings and is to become abundantly productive and even the ferocious nature of the wild beast is to be tamed. Evil, however, does not cease to exist nor is it necessarily decreased in amount but it is held in check by the rod of iron rule of Christ and at the end of the millennium it breaks out in a terrible rebellion that all but overwhelms the saints and the holy city. During the millennium the saints in glorified bodies mingle freely with men who still are in the flesh. 
This latter element in particular seems to us to present an inconsistency. A mongrel kingdom, the new earth and glorified sinless humanity mingling with the old earth and sinful humanity. Christ and the saints in immortal resurrection bodies, living in a world that still contains much of sin and amid scenes of death and decay. To bring Christ and the saints to live again in the sinful environment of this world would seem to be the equivalent of introducing sin into heaven. As the amillennialist William J. Greer has observed, such a company would indeed be a mixtum gatherum. Amillennialists, of course, reject both the post and the premillennial conception and are usually content to say that there will be no millennium at all in either sense of the word. The terms are, therefore, somewhat inaccurate and misleading. For that reason, some theologians hesitate to label themselves either post, ah, or premillennial. But no more appropriate terms are available. These terms serve at least to distinguish the different schools of thought, and their meaning is generally understood. But while the three schools differ in regard to the meaning of the word millennium, that does not mean that the word itself is meaningless nor that the distinctions between the systems are imaginary or unimportant. Quite the contrary, actually these systems represent widely divergent views concerning this very important subject, which, as we shall see, have far-reaching consequences. A broader and perhaps more accurate terminology has been suggested by some, that of Chilius and Antichilius. Chilius would then include both historic premillennialists and dispensationalists, while anti-Chilius would include both post- and amillennialists, without making it necessary to choose between these. Furthermore, the fact that some who designate themselves amillennialists hold that the present church age constitutes the millennium and that Christ will come at the close of the church age might seem to make them postmillennialists. But since the primary tenet of postmillennialism, as generally understood, is that the coming of Christ is to follow a golden age of righteousness and peace, those who look upon the entire church age as the millennium are not commonly referred to as postmillennialists. Chapter 5, page 22 A Redeemed World or Race Footnote Some of the material in pages 22 to 47 is taken from an earlier book by the present writer, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, pages 130 through 143. End of footnote. On postmillennial principles, a strong emphasis is thrown on the universality of Christ's work of redemption, and hope is held out for the salvation of an incredibly large number of the race of mankind. Since it was the world or the race which fell in Adam, it was the world, or the race, which was the object of Christ's redemption. This does not mean that every individual will be saved, but that the race, as a race, will be saved. Jehovah is no mere tribal deity, but is described as the Lord of the whole earth, a great king over all the earth. Psalm 97 verse 5 and 47 verse 2 The salvation that he had in view cannot be limited to a little select group or favored few. The good news of redemption was not merely local news for a few villages in Palestine, but was a world message, and the abundant and continuous testimony of Scripture is that the kingdom of God is to fill the earth from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 9 verse 10 Early in the Old Testament we have the promise that all the earth shall be filled with the glory of Jehovah, Numbers 14, 21. And Isaiah repeats the promise that all flesh shall see the glory of Jehovah, chapter 40, verse 5. 